Why did you come this morning? What are your expectations here today? Who did you come to see or to hear from? You probably have some different answers to those questions. But I just ask these next few moments we push aside those answers, whatever they might be, and come expectant to what God might have for us. Maybe everything's been going great in your life and you have much to give God thanks for to praise Him. And maybe there's been some days this week that have been a little tough. Perhaps you've lived life in between. That's how most of our weeks normally would go. But aren't you glad that God's here with us regardless of the good, the bad, and the ugly that we go through? And this morning as we go to prayer, He's ready to meet with us right where we're at. He knows what you're going through. He knows what's ahead. And he just wants to spend some time with us. He wants us to desire to spend time with him. What's your heart's desire this morning? Whatever it might be, let's allow him to help us to prepare to receive what he has for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. As Jesus modeled for us, we hallowed your name. We lift it up. It's a big churchy word. Maybe we won't realize what it means, but it just means to put you in the right position. Perhaps, Lord, in these moments to take ourselves off the throne and to put you back where you belong. To humble ourselves, Father, to take the correct posture that we should take when we're before our Creator, the one who loves us, the one who gave his Son to redeem us. Help us, Lord, as we come to you in prayer today to recognize, to acknowledge, to give praise and thanks for who you are. If you do nothing else for us, you've already done enough. And Lord, we're in your house this morning. Perhaps brought here by different motivations for different reasons. Regardless of what it is that caused us to come, we're here right now, Lord, in your presence. Lord, what a tragedy it would be to be in this place and to not hear your voice. So Lord, I pray this morning you would help us to push aside what might be distracting us or the who's or or the what awaits us and to just give you a few moments speak, maybe to comfort, to help, to lift up, to heal. And perhaps this is the first time all week we've paused and given you a little bit of space and time in our lives. God, be faithful. May your spirit move among us. As we hallow your name this morning. So when we do that, when we begin by by lifting you up, everything else tends to fall into place, just as Jesus Christ modeled for us. Because when we hallow your name, Lord, now, then, Lord, we can pray for your will to be done. As we discussed a few weeks ago, Lord, to pray for your will to be done at the same time means for us to let go of our wills, our wants, our desires, even, Lord, to some degree, our burdens doesn't mean you no longer care. It doesn't mean that those things don't matter. They do. But Lord, when you're in the right place in our hearts, in our lives, then everything else tends to make a little bit more sense. Take those difficult moments that many are experiencing right now. Perhaps it's a diagnosis that's not encouraging or maybe it's a time of loneliness or discouragement or depression they find themselves in. Maybe they're divided, perhaps from their spouse or from a friend, even from someone in this congregation this morning, Lord, and Satan is using that division to to just create a wedge and to weigh us down. Pray, Lord, you'll step into our lives in whatever way is needed this morning. Meet us there and help us. Lord, we thank you for your provision. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for for meeting needs and for your faithfulness that is just indescribable at times. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for a faith family, uh, the the people of this church that equally, Lord, then respond to your faithfulness in kind by by giving back so that we can make a difference and minister to this community. We are a church that's not just here to gather to make ourselves feel good, but Lord, we're we're called to, to be your hands and feet in a community and a culture that needs it. To be salt and light, Lord, in a world that is flavorless, tasteless in many ways, and dark in so many other ways, Lord. We become that difference. So God, and we pray that, that you would do something. Help us to recognize that perhaps we're the something. We just need to choose, as, Mo, as Noah did last week, Lord, to be obedient. To walk with you. 
Lord, at the same time, walk against, many times, Father, our culture, our world. God, change us today. May our desire, Lord, this morning be you. Reveal yourself to us. Help us to hear your voice, to be obedient to your spirit. And when our time this morning here is done, to leave this place different than how we've come. So Lord, to be with you is to be changed by you. Have your way with us, Lord, this morning. May your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we started collecting uh, more of your information, some updates, so we could get to know you. And one thing you're already doing that helps us get to know you is connection moments. And we have another one this morning, and Christy Anderson is going to come and share with us today what God's put on her heart. Good morning. My name is Christy Anderson, and I'm going to share a scripture with you before I take you on a little journey. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's in Jeremiah 29:11. I'm going to take you on a little journey of my life. From the time I was a little girl, I wanted to be a teacher. So I had a grade book, and the kids that I liked, I gave good grades to. And the kids I didn't like, I gave bad grades to. So watch out. And I grew up, my mother was very creative, and so I really had instilled of me that there's creation. The Lord created all of us, so he is a very creative God. So the first thing I did is I took a stretch and sew class, and it was a lecture demo, and they taught you, they gave you this t-shirt, and you were supposed to put this collar on it, and I stretched it all right, because it kind of came down like this, and I came back to the class, and the teacher said, well, what did you do wrong? And I thought, well, if I knew what I did wrong, I wouldn't do that. So flop, that didn't work. So then I went to a craft store called Lee Ward's and I was gonna become a cake decorator. Hey, who doesn't like cake? You know, cake, icing, great. So then the teacher came around and said, I can't possibly teach you this because your hands are too small to fit around the piping bags. Oh, flop. So that was a disaster. So then I decided I could be folk art painting and I don't know why I thought I could do that because I couldn't even draw a stick figure. But I decided I would try that. And the teacher came around and looked at what I did and she said, you know, she said, vodka will take anything off wood. And I thought, vodka, okay. Where am I gonna go and get that? Well, at that time, they had state liquor stores. So I said, Lord, please don't let anybody from the church see me go in this state liquor store. So I creep in and I go up to the counter and I ask the guy, I said, I want the cheapest vodka you have. And he looks at me like, oh, wow, she's young. But anyway, I got it and they put it in a brown paper bag and I snuck out to the car. And sure enough, it worked. Everything disappeared. Oh, that wasn't my thing either. So then I said, well, Lord, I, you've given me this desire. What am I going to do with it? Where are you guiding me to go? So I went to this shop out in Plain City, and I thought, I love fabric, I love color, so I'm going to be a quilter. Well, I should have known I wasn't going to do a very good job at that, because it was lecture demo again. And this teacher really didn't give us a whole lot of, how shall I say, instruction. So remember my t-shirt that was kind of all stretched out? That's the way my quilt blocks looked. And it was like deja vu all over again. She said, well, what did you do wrong? And I thought, Oh my gosh, if I knew what I did wrong, I wouldn't have done it. So that was another flop. And I thought, oh, what have you got, Lord? You've given me something I know you have. So I went to another shop. And this time I had a teacher who really knew what she was doing. And I started out just very slow. And she kept pushing me and pushing me to dry something harder. And then she said, would you like me to make samples for my shop? And I thought, wow. Okay, I'll do that. And then she said, would you like to teach? And I thought, oh, golly, Lord, what I've always done deep in my heart, you're giving me that chance to do that. So 30 plus years later, I started when I was two, of course. So 30 years plus later, 
I'm still quilting, and I love it. And this past spring, I got a chance to teach some of our people a collective that I just really, truly loved, and I hope I get that opportunity again. So no matter what journey you're going on, no matter what the Lord has instilled in your heart, He will guide your path. He will take you there. Just be patient. It might not be the same path that you think you were supposed to do, but He'll still do it for you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Christy. What a great reminder. Your failures... Your flops are only failures if you stop. Don't let them stop you, but keep looking. Maybe they're just revealing a way or a direction that God would have for you if you just keep searching. Love that story. We all have our own flops in life, don't we? Some more than others, for sure, but aren't you glad that God continues to be faithful if we keep looking? And um, I have enough of those in my own life we'll talk about over the years, but... Um, we started a conversation last week called Ordinary People, looking at just the ordinary people in Scripture and what God did through them as a reminder that we ourselves are ordinary people, and perhaps you feel that more than others. And there's certainly days where we get discouraged or we wonder what God's going to do with us, but it's in our ordinariness that God tends to do his best work and, and how in just being willing to be available and to be obedient, then, then God does the extra in our lives and turns the ordinary into extraordinary. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, this is the message version. This is what God tells us through Paul's writing. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Just pause there for just a moment. If you were to do that right now, in this very moment, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, what kind of offering would that be? Some of us will be hesitant to, to give God that because we know, Lord, it's just ordinary. It's just plain. It's, there's really nothing special about it. Lord, when I bring you an offering, I want it to be something of significance. So often we hold back because we don't feel like we measure up or we don't have enough to offer. And what Paul is telling us is that God, that's exactly what he wants, is your ordinary. He wants the time when you're resting, when you're eating and fellowshipping with one another. He wants the time when you're at work or when you're just going through life or if you're at the soccer fields or, or in the cornfield, wherever it may be, wherever God has placed you. He just wants you to give that to him and let him do something through it that only he can. Perhaps creatively, perhaps just... This everyday sense, if we give it to God as an offering, he has a way of multiplying it in ways that we never could. Growing up, where I lived, we didn't have county fairs growing up, but we had district fairs, depending on where you were at. And my family and I recently went to the Union County Fair. We had a good time there. We got to watch our, kind of our community in action. We learned a lot, got to see some good friends. And what I enjoy always at the fairs are, uh, something I'll get to in just a few moments, but when I was a kid, I went to the Winfield District Fair. It was out on Bunner's Ridge, about past my house, and up on another side of the hill, and the Winfield District Fair. And one particular year, my cousin Cheryl, she was the fair queen. And so as the fair queen, the next year, she has to, she's in charge of kind of putting together of the court, if you will, and I was asked to be the crown bearer for the Winfield District Fair. I got all decked out in my nice crown bearer suit. Uh, there's a really fun picture of it that I really don't want anyone else to see. And, but, but I got to, to be part of the festivities and the ceremony when they crowned the fair queen at the Winfield District Fair. That was my first real remember, memory of being exposed to the fair. Now, since that time, I've learned to love fairs for three reasons. Funnel cakes, the scrambler, and tractor pulls. I really have learned to like the tractor pulls. When I was a kid at the Winfield District Fair, I remember my dad taking me, my grandfather, and my Uncle Jack would always help with uh, officiating the tractor pulls or the horse pulls when I was a kid. And there's a lot to be learned if you're paying attention and watching tractor pulls. There's a lot of physics involved. So if you weren't expecting a physics lesson this morning, well, this is free. You're, you're going to get this one for free. And, and I'm, I, I understand this because I took it twice. So after the second time, you really start to get it more. Uh, but the object of a tractor pull it's to see how far a tractor can pull a sled, can pull the weight. And the one that can go the farthest or the farther down the track is the one who wins. 
So you, you've got this sled, if you will, that they hook up to the back of a tractor pull. Now we know if you're really old timers, you remember when tractors pulls were tractor against tractor. And you see who could pull one backwards and forwards. That's, that's real tractor pulling. But we don't want to damage our expensive tractors today. So we've learned a different way to do it. So we hook ourselves up to a sled. Now on this sled, there's a, there's a set of wheels on the back, but on the front there's what they call a skid plate. And I may be getting some of my terminology wrong. And in West Virginia, it really doesn't matter because nobody knows the difference. But here in Union County, everybody knows the difference. So if I get the terminology wrong, just bear with me and know that I'm really not from here. I'm still learning. But so it's not an ordinary sled, though. It's, he's got a skid plate on one end, wheels on the other. But there's this weight. There's this load, if you will. Then the load is a dynamic load. And what that means is it moves as the sled moves. So as the sled is pulled down the track, the load on the sled moves forward towards the skid plate. Some of you are nodding your head, you're tracking with me, you think, okay, he's got it right so far. And, and so consequently, the load is transferred from the wheels on the back of the sled to the rear wheels, eventually, of the tractor. So now you get to see what's beginning to happen physically. So the faster the tractor moves dynamically, the faster the load moves to the front. Now the dirt track initially offers traction. It provides something for the tires to bite into. But this same dirt eventually becomes part of the problem. As the tractor wheels dig into the dirt, once the load reaches a certain weight or gets closer to the tractor itself, causing the tractor to lose traction. According to Newton's laws of physics, or laws, a law of motion, an object in motion will stay in motion until acted upon by an outside force. So the principle of physics that we see in this, moment, in this situation is called momentum. The faster the tractor can get up to speed, the more force will be required to stop it. Or in the case of a tractor pull, the heavier the load of the sled. So if you've ever been to the fair, if you've ever watched the pulls, you, now you understand what's going on. The weight doesn't get heavier, the weight just gets closer. So stay with me spiritually, we're going to make this make sense in a few moments. As it gets closer on the sled, the weight moves closer to the axle of the tractor. The force from the same weight eventually becomes greater as it approaches the tractor. And what once was momentum begins to slow down and as the wheels are pulled now down into the dirt. The same force that applies to the tractor pull also, church, applies to us. We're the tractor. The track is our mission. The load, our conversation today will hopefully reveal what the load is in your life. The load that we carry through life, eventually, once we continue down our mission through our life's journey, moves closer to us, and it weighs us down. Eventually, we lose traction, and we end up just spinning our wheels in the dirt. So how do you get free from that? Well, at the end of a tractor pull, when a tractor's on as far as it can, the, the other tractors come down, the, the tractor backs up a little bit, and they just disconnect from the sled. And this morning, some of us need to get disconnected from the load that we're carrying. Because it's weighing us down. It's preventing us from moving on down the track, from being who God wants us to be. Now, I don't know what your particular weight is that you're carrying. I don't know what's on top of your skid plate pulling your wheels down into the dirt, but God does. I have a direction that I'm going to go, but even right now I believe the Holy Spirit is probably speaking to many of us, saying, you know what, for you, you've got something you need to get disconnected from. Don't ignore the Lord in these moments. Listen to him. Let him help you figure it out. And we're going to figure it out together as a church. Here at the Marysville Church of the Nazarene, we, we of course are, are a church of the Nazarene. We believe in sanctification, being set apart for God's purposes. We believe in holiness. We are a holiness denomination, believing that we can be made pure uh, from our sinful nature by, by the act and by the filling of the Holy Spirit. And, and because of this, that we believe that God wants to do something significant in our lives. But sanctification and even holiness to a certain degree is meaningless apart from God's mercy and His grace. Holiness is impossible apart from forgiveness and reconciliation. Mercy and grace are best exemplified through forgiveness and being reconciled with one another. And we'll talk about unforgiveness today and the weight that that could put on so many of us. I'm going to talk about being reconciled to God and to one another today and how freeing that could be. It's getting unhooked from the things that weigh us down. Whether we realize it or not, there's probably some 
level of unforgiveness that, that many of us deal with or have dealt with in the past. There, there's been some reason or cause of division that, that's, that's caused us to not be united, if you will, be of one spirit. And, and the longer we allow that to exist among us, the longer we stay weighed down just spinning our wheels in the dirt as a church. As a pastor, I don't want that. And I hope and pray that you don't want that either. So would we be willing to be honest with ourselves this morning and allow the Holy Spirit to come and to reveal to us today what it might be that's weighing us down? What's caused us to choose to live life our own way? What's caused us perhaps to live life holding on to this bitterness? Or whatever it might be that's keeping us separated from God and perhaps even one another. It's often in these moments when our wheels are spinning that we become more concerned about what is good for us. Not caring or pausing to think about what might be good for others, what God might have for us. It's easy when we're offended to feel justified in our position, to kind of dig our heels in, so to speak. Or when we offend others, to claim that being right is okay. The reality is some of us need to let go of our right to be right for the sake of being reconciled, forgiven, and a working, healthy relationship with one another with God. Because if we don't, the tendency is to get pulled down into the dirt. And we know what happens when it rains, when we find ourselves in the dirt, is we end up in the mud. Oftentimes, just like the tractor, weighed down. Each of us, we want Christ to forgive us, and we want God to forget our transgressions, but when it comes to us, we're often not as quick, not just to forgive, but certainly not quick to forget. We hold on to those things that hurt us, those grudges, those wounds. We often hold it over the head of those that have offended or hurt us. We feel justified. After all, uh, if our position's the right one, why would we want to let it go? Because that's what grace does. See, we want grace freely and unconditionally extended to us, and if that's the case, then we also have to extend that to others. If we don't, then we don't really understand it. We probably haven't truly received it. Because to be given God's grace is to be transformed by it and to react differently when and given the opportunity to share with someone else. We see reconciliation in Scripture not as often as you might think, but we do see it in Paul's letters. Paul writes in Romans, be reconciled to God. He then writes in First and Second Corinthians uh, about this ministry of reconciliation. And Jesus only mentions reconciliation uh, just a few times. It's only actually the only times in the Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. What Jesus is saying in this moment, don't come and worship me if there's something in your life weighing you down. You have to be disconnected from the sled before you can come and find me. Some today, perhaps you've come and you're here to worship, yet you're still dragging behind you your sled. You find it difficult. You find something in the way, and we feel justified in holding on to it because, after all, we, we think that we're right. But in reality, what is keeping us disconnected from is not one another, but ultimately from God term reconcile that Jesus uses. It's a kind of a political term. It's a term that uh, talks about uh, a dispute or a conflict and, and working your way through it. It's a term that re talks about being restored to one's favor. Ultimately, Jesus is talking about restoring relationships. If you want to bring your offering to me, be in a right relationship with me, Jesus says, then you've got to be in a right relationship with one another. Going back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and continuing what Paul writes again through the message, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Don't get so used to what the world's doing around you that you start worrying about what it says is right or what it expects. And we stop thinking and asking, what does God expect from us? What does this have to do with ordinary people? 
Well, the story we're going to talk about today is found in Genesis chapters 37 through 45. Now, I'm going to talk about all of that. We could be here a long time going through all of that. But, but specifically, we're going to end up in Genesis chapter 45. But before we get there, really quickly, the background on, on, a very, on a character we see in Genesis named Joseph. Now, his story, to tell it quickly, we, we learn a lot about Joseph in the first 11 verses of chapter 37. The story picks up, and, and he's 17 years old, and we know that he, he's a, in a family of, of, of shepherds, if you will, and his father, Jacob, has, has other sons, sons that uh, from his other wives, if you, we're not going to go back to and talk about the story of Jacob, but Jacob had one son and through, through Rachel, and his name was Joseph. Joseph was the favorite. I know we're not supposed to talk having favorite kids, and I'm like, don't, parents don't look around right now. This is not the time to do that. You're going to create some problems if you do. And, but, but Joseph was his father's favorite, and he didn't even try to hide it. We, we know about Joseph and his coat of many colors, and he was separated, and we see very early on this was creating problems. And in the first 11 verses, we see Joseph doesn't help things. He's kind of spoiled. He's kind of got this arrogance about him, and he has these dreams. And in his dreams, basically the interpretation is his brothers eventually were going to bow down and worship him. Now, he's the youngest at the time. That's not how things worked. And he has a second dream where not only his brother's going to bow down and worship him, but so is his mother and father. Now, that didn't go over too well with mom and dad. So his brothers, very quickly we learn in the 11 verses, they don't like him. They're looking for ways to, to not be around him, to basically hurt him. And we see in verse 12, now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Jacob, or Israel, said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing. Over here, I want to send you to them. So Joseph goes. His brothers see him coming from far off, and they start to plot amongst themselves. Here comes that dreamer. Here comes that pain in the, well, you know what? We see his coat. We know it's him. Let's kill him. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty significant. They don't kill him. They end up, Reuben intercedes and, and, and saves Joseph's life. They throw him into a cistern, and Reuben intends to let him out later. Uh, but as, as Reuben goes to do something else, here comes this caravan on its way to Egypt, and the brothers get together, and Judah says, hey, why don't we sell them? We could get something out of this. So they sell Joseph to, to, the, to the traders on their way to Egypt, and Joseph gets taken to Egypt, and while he's there, he gets sold as a slave. He ends up in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's kind of the chief of police, if you will, kind of, kind of over the royal guard, and Joseph ends up a slave, who just days before, moments before, was the favorite. Now he's nothing. He was really good at what he did. Even as a slave, he did his best, and he was working his way up the ranks in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife gets the wrong ideas and tries to well, take advantage of Joseph. Joseph refuses. Potiphar's wife doesn't like that, so she makes up this story, and Joseph ends up in jail, in prison. He goes from being the favorite to, to being sold as a slave to now being in prison. But Joseph keeps being faithful, keeps true to what he's been taught, and I imagine he had a lot of time to think, and he does well even in prison and starts to work his way up the ranks. And then the, the chief of the prison puts Joseph in charge of some of the other prisoners. And it's, it's kind of an interesting story. Remember, Joseph likes to dream, and he ends up in prison one day with the king, Pharaoh's cupbearer and, and baker, and he, he interprets their dreams, and they come true. They come true. One dies, one's restored. Joseph ends up eventually getting called before Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. We know the story of the famine that's coming. They're going to have seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, and Joseph interprets the dreams for Pharaoh. Pharaoh likes what he hears, elevates Joseph from prisoner to second in command, vice president, if you will, of all of Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world at this time. But to get there wasn't easy. 17 years old, sold as a slave. He was a slave for about a year. He ended up being in prison about 12 years, we think, in Scripture. So 30 years old, he's now second in command of Egypt. So many times in my life when things aren't going the way that I want them to, I often wonder, Lord, am I, am I Joseph in prison? What is it that you're doing? Or am I Joseph as a slave? Neither one seemed very appealing. But Lord, I think you're up to something. What is it you're doing? being patient enough to allow God the time and the space to work in our lives. So now Joseph finds himself second in command, and he spends seven years kind of uh, putting away the extra food of, from, from the seasons of plenty, and we're about two years into the season of famine, so Joseph's approximately 39 years old, maybe 40 years old at this point, when one day who walks into his 
office, so to speak, to get food, but his brothers. Wow. <laughs> Can you just imagine his face? I've dreamed of this moment. <laughs> Here they are. But not Joseph. Scripture tells us he weeps at the sight of his family. He gives them the food that they desire, and he sends them on their way, but he doesn't really believe their story. He's trying to figure out how to really work this to his advantage, but, but not just to have revenge so that maybe God's got, he's up to something, and he wants to know if his dad's still alive, and he has all of these conversations with his brothers, and he sends them on back to home, but he, but he keeps one as a prisoner just so that they'll come back. He wants to meet his younger brother, Benjamin. They don't want to bring Benjamin because you know, Jacob's not going to let Benjamin go because he's already lost Joseph. A lot of fast forwarding here, about eight chapters we just kind of flew through. They do come back. And in chapter 45, they're before Joseph again. He's tried to play some, some really kind of funny tricks on them and got the best of them. And they're all sweating now that they're before Joseph. And because he puts his silver cup in Benjamin's sack, now their brothers are all worried that something's going to happen to Benjamin. And they all start to cry out, no, no, not him, anybody but him. You don't know what this will do to my dad. Read in verse 1 of chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And in verse 2, he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. Pharaoh's household heard about it. The weight that Joseph had been dragging down the track was so heavy that he wept so loudly even Pharaoh heard about it. I think at this moment, he, he, he's kind of wondering, what's he going to do up to this point? Why play all the games? Why, why, why the trickery? Why, why the, the kind of the, the hidden stuff that's been going on? Because I don't think he's quite figured out yet what he's going to do, but in this moment, he does. And Joseph decides, I'm going to unhook what I've been dragging behind me for these last 13 years. This is the moment that, that he has been waiting on. He says in verse 3, I am Joseph. In case you're wondering if you weren't sure, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer. And then because huh, they're terrified. You're who? What? And I love verse four. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. Uh-uh. <laughs> no way. Am I getting close to No way. Just come on. Come close to me. It's like when your kids are in trouble and you tell them to come here. They're, they're, they are really slow. When my dad did that when I was a kid, it was like, okay, I come closer. But you know, <laughs> you know you're kind of protecting yourself. You're getting yourself ready. Because you know what's about to come. You know, you know what you deserve. And his brothers, they know. They, they've seen the pain that they've caused. That They know what they deserve. Joseph's come close to me. <laughs> and when they done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph. The one you sold into Egypt. Just kind of reminding them. I'm here because of you. But, but not to get back at them. He continues in verse 5. And now do not be distressed and not be angry with yourselves for selling me because it's to save lives that God has sent me ahead of you. Somehow Joseph, when he disconnects himself from the sled, now is able to see that God has been in this. If anyone had reason to get revenge or to be angry, it's Joseph. Here he finds himself. He has the means. He has the position. He has the authority. He has the opportunity. He could punish his brothers and no one would ever know. He could bury them in the sand in the backyard. It would just be forgotten because of who he has become. But Joseph responds with grace. He wants to be reconciled. But, but what, what about what his brothers deserved? What about what was right for Joseph? To see, too often we're worried about that. We want what's fair. Well, and fair is such a dangerous word when it comes to God. Now, I'm not implying that all of our division is ordained by God. That's not, a, I don't think that's true at all. But rather, I'm drawing attention to Joseph's response. Forgiveness. When forgiveness is the last thing that made any sense. Some of you have been hurt by people. And the wounds are real. The scars are still there. 
Maybe there's things going on even inside of, of our faith family where there's division, and you don't think it's causing any problem. You think it's just your issue, and you can carry it on your own, but the truth is eventually it's going to come out, and you're going to weigh the wheels down, and we're going to stop moving. You're going to kill our momentum because it has to be dealt with. God wants us to reconcile. We can't bring our offerings before God until we've reconciled with one another. And I know that's not easy. This is a difficult message to preach, especially so, so things have been going really well on the surface. And I believe that things are so, uh, so much potential here. But, but I don't want to just live on potential. I want to free and, and to release the Holy Spirit to work among us. And sometimes that requires that we disconnect ourselves from the sled that we're dragging behind. So what is it that's weighing you down? What is this Jesus referred to back in Matthew that, that might be between you and a brother or a sister? What is it that requires a response that the way that Joseph responded in your life? See, Joseph sees reconciliation to God as this means of God saving his people. And ultimately, that's exactly what he does. He gets reunited with his father. His father, his family moved down to Egypt and well, there's an incredible story that comes out of that that we'll get to in our time together. Because it's evidence of God continuing to work out his plan. His will will be done. But first, Joseph has to let go of what's between them to be reconciled to them. Matthew chapter 18. We see this account where, where Peter comes up to Jesus. We'll talk about Peter in a few weeks because Peter's very ordinary. He's extraordinary in some ways, but not the ways that maybe we would like. And he asks him, says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Peter has this really genuine question. But even that there's this ulterior motive even to Peter's question. Then he says, up to seven times. Now that seven is not just an arbitrary number because in, in Jewish culture, in rabbinic teaching was you were to forgive up to three times. You could forgive someone three times for the same offense, but you didn't have to forgive them the fourth time. That's certainly not a teaching that Jesus had. So Jesus, he's listening to Peter's question. So when Peter says seven times, he's trying to kind of, kind of puff himself up a little bit. I'll ask Jesus if I should forgive more than two times what the law teaches me to forgive. That'll kind of make me sound smart and spiritual to Jesus, right? So Peter's got this ulterior motive. And Jesus' response is, is not to kind of, I can just see Jesus grinning at Peter. He says, you just don't get it. He says, Jesus answers, I tell you not seven times but 77 times. Now, if you're keeping track at home, Jesus is not saying that you should be keeping track at home. Don't so, well, I haven't answered. Oh, that's been 72 times. I've only got to forgive them five more times for this. Jesus is saying, this is hyperbole. This is like, it's, it's kind of an exaggeration. Not just 77 times, not the three times that rabbinic law teaches you or the seven times you suggested, Peter, but you're to always forgive. So if you want to put limits on forgiveness on one another, then what am I to do with you, Jesus says. My grace is free. My grace is limitless. And then Jesus goes on to, to explain what he means, but he starts into this parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like. And anytime Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, we should be paying attention to what he's talking about. He's in the story of the unmerciful servant who had been forgiven and didn't forgive. We realize to be part of the kingdom, forgiveness is essential. It's not meant to condemn us. This, this story isn't meant to, 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 to keep us captive, but rather to free us. Jesus gives us the opportunity to disconnect ourselves from the sled, from the weight that's pulling us down. Lewis Smedes writes in his book, The Art of Forgiving, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to realize that that prisoner was you. See, often forgiveness isn't about the other person at all. Rather, it's about what's holding us down. It's just as much, if not more, for the offended as it is for the transgressor. And with forgiveness comes freedom. Not for the one that you're forgiving. Freedom for ourselves. And in that, we find reconciliation. Now, Jesus says, you've taken care of that. Now that you've found freedom, now bring me your offerings. Now bring me who you are. Because now there's nothing keeping you from me. And you can be all mine, God says. See, reconciliation is required even if you're the one who was offended. Quick story, when I was in school, I had a situation with uh, some friends, and I'll be honest, they were wrong. And I'm not just saying that flippantly. They were wrong. They, they did something that was very hurtful to me, and, and they were wrong. 
And, and I remember in a service one, one day, I was at, at, at a chapel service, and I remember listening to the Lord. It was a kind of a message similar to this. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, this is great. You need to speak to them so they can come and be reconciled to me. Because they're wrong. And I, I, sincerely, they are wrong. But here's what God said to me. Now I want you to get up and be reconciled to them. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, God. I didn't do anything. They're the ones. I, I know, Brian, but right now your attitude is keeping you from me. I need you to go fix it. And I'm like, oh. So I did. I got up and I went to them and said, you know, I, I need to apologize for, for my attitude uh, because of, of what's happened between us. Now they knew what happened between us. They're the ones who did it. And I thought, when I would go, I said, all right, Lord, I see what you're doing. I'm going to go and apologize for my attitude. And they're just going to break down. I said, oh, we're so sorry we did that to you, Brian. And they looked at me and they said, we accept your apology. Lord, that is not what I thought was going to happen. And God said, don't worry about them. I want to free you. And I walked away and it was fine. I I had let it go. And, I, and it was, it was like unhooking my, that weight behind me and I was just to move on from it. It's, it's you know, we're, we're not really friends. That's okay. We're not enemies either. We're just, that's just kind of how life goes sometimes. But I had to let go of that stuff that when I was dragging behind me, it was kind of weighing me down because God had other things for me and I couldn't experience them because I was stuck. But I found freedom. And we all can find that this morning. We can move forward, but we first have to disconnect the sled from our tractor. And I believe right now the Holy Spirit is speaking. I believe there's some phone calls that might need to be made this afternoon. Maybe some emails or texts to be sent. Or maybe we just need to get with someone and we need to reconcile with our brother, with that thing that is between us before we bring our offerings before God. The question is, are we going to take the first step? Are we going to seek forgiveness? Just as Noah taught us to be obedient, Joseph teaches us to forgive. But to leave what's right or our idea of what's right behind, to let go of being fair, of everything working out the way that we want them to, and let God have his way with us. That's where healing comes from. That's where God does his best work. It's in the midst of a painful situation when his people are willing to be obedient and humble themselves. And now, make no mistake, Satan wants nothing more than for us to remain in the midst of our brokenness. For us to be divided. For us to stay stuck. God has so much for us. Make no mistake, church, also, we're going to move forward. And whatever it might be that's holding you down, we're going to give the Holy Spirit time and time and time again to deal with us, to help us, to free us. I invite you to stand with me. And I'm not going to have an altar call necessarily, but as we pray, and, and we're adults here, we can bow our heads, we can close our eyes, we can be respectful of one another. I just wonder, as we pray, and I want to give you opportunities to respond between God and, and myself. And let the Holy Spirit speak to us. And what might be weighing you down? Let's pray together. Okay, heads bowed, eyes closed. We can do this. Father, your grace is such an incredible thing. It forgives, it frees, it restores, it heals. But Lord, to receive your grace, it it then does something to us. It compels us, Lord, to go and to fix that which might be broken between one another. So Lord, I I don't know this morning what it is you're doing or how it is you're working amongst your people. But I believe, Lord, there's something going on here this morning. I can feel it. I just wonder how many this morning would say, Pastor, you know what? I've got some reconciling I need to do. There's some weight I'm carrying. and I just need you to pray for me that I would have the courage, the opportunity to fix it. Will you raise your hand? You've got some stuff you're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's some others today. You're carrying a weight and you just want God to help you let it go. Thank you. 
Thank you. Lord, forgiveness is no small thing. It's what makes us right before God. It's only possible through the blood of Jesus Christ who, who covers us, Lord. And right now, as, as, as we rest in that reconciled relationship, maybe there's something you're calling us to do, someone you're calling us to go to, conversation you're calling us to have, something you're calling us to let go of, Lord. And whatever it might be, help us, Lord, to be willing. Open the door for us, Lord, to walk through. Moses taught us obedience to simply go and do, to walk so closely with you that we don't question where it is that you're taking us. But now today we might find that that, that, that journey is taking us to a place that's uncomfortable for us. And now, Lord, we need the, the ordinary lesson of Joseph to forgive in order, Lord, to get disconnected from our sled. God, have your way with us this morning. Free those, Lord, who are seeking it. I pray, Lord, you'd convict those, Lord, that are still holding on. Make them miserable this week. In a holy way, of course, Father. Continue, God, to help us to become who you want us to be. Be glorified, God, I pray, even in our dysfunction, especially in our brokenness. Lord, continue what it is you've started here this morning as we go about your work this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I send you off with how we started. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. When you let go, you'll be amazed to see what God does. God bless you. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.